Hello, my name is Dr. Jennifer Castledine Brock. I'm a full-time university faculty in the School of General Education and Humanities, Hope Social Sciences at Purdue Global. And I am talking about mitigating stereotype threat in the classroom for today's presentation. So what is stereotype threat? Stereotype threat refers to being at risk of confirming as self-characteristic a negative stereotype about one's group, right? And it can uh, come about from low expectations. Uh, there's an article, Gender Stereotypes in Women's Math Performance by Claude Steele and Diane Quinn. They include this quote from Virginia Woolf's book entitled, A Room of One's Own. There was an enormous body of masculine opinion to the effect that nothing could be expected of women intellectually. Even if her father did not read out loud these opinions, any girl could read them for herself. And the reading, even in the 19th century, must have lowered her vitality and told profoundly upon her work. There would always have been that assertion, you cannot do this, you're incapable of doing that, to protest against, to overcome. When, while society is making progress since the time of Virginia Woolf, stereotypes still exist especially in certain cultures, family environments. For accomplished women, it can be a persistent problem and pop up in spite of our accomplishments. Since many of my courses are in the humanities, my PhD is in the field of, of philosophy. Uh, my background, uh, my master's degree was in analytic philosophy and a lot of those analytic um, philosophy conferences, you know, back in the day, there were not a lot of women always uh, participating in them. And it can be that kind of feeling of not seeing anybody like yourself in the room and wondering, do I really uh, belong here? Uh, but and so I, well, that's one of the reasons I wanted to focus a bit on uh, philosophy and stereotype, just because uh, that is, is my background. But of course, this applies to mathematics, the humanities, uh, you know, all the uh, STEM fields, that sort of thing. It's certainly not just philosophy. Okay, so I put this quote up um, in this slide just to draw your attention to how even accomplished people can experience stereotype threat. On this PowerPoint slide is a quote by Jennifer Saul. For those of you maybe unfamiliar with her name, she has a PhD in philosophy. She's published books, numerous journal articles. Uh, she even completed an 18 month project for the United Kingdom's cabinet office, helping them to improve the diversity of the United Kingdom's government security workforce. She's the chair of her department, the chair of various committees. She has an impressive record of accomplishment in her field. Yet she shares how stereotype threat impacts her own life. And so this is just the quote from the PowerPoint file, right? One might speculate, however, that if a woman achieves success and security, she will at least cease to suffer from stereotype threat. And she says it's probably true that stereotype threat will be reduced, perhaps even eliminated for some. And there are studies, uh, by the way, that show that it, it does indeed help. But as you can see here, it's not a... Um, complete fix, right? Uh, and she said it's, you know, not a problem that will disappear. She's a full professor, all the publications, the department she loves. And she says, I feel completely at ease, despite the fact women are poorly represented. But, you know, it did not make her immune, right? She tells this story where uh, she goes into the se seminar room. They're decorated by uh, the walls by filling them with pictures of famous philosophers but every single picture was that of a man, right? So you're just kind of looking around and there's all the men. And, you know, you do kind of sometimes wonder, do I belong here? And she said, apparently after, you know, after the talk, there was a lone woman, but <laughs> that was behind her. And everyone in the audience was a man. I think that's why it resonated uh, with me because been there, done that, right? And she said two women then arrived, but the room was still overwhelmingly male. And she's given the paper. She starts to think, is it going well? Maybe it's, you know, going poorly. She finds herself nervous and she sees stumbling over words, answering questions hesitantly and poorly. And, you know, she'd given the paper several times successfully, right? It, it wasn't a problem. It wasn't a new paper. Uh, she was presenting these same ideas. 
And she even knew about the stereotype threat. I mean, I wonder how much worse would it have been if she didn't know about it, right? But that awareness didn't necessarily keep it from happening. You know, so she says, now I think of it as a stereotype threat room. And she did tell the department, um, you know, members, hey, ask the pictures of women to the walls, right? And so this is, you know, uh, focused on gender and stereotype uh, threat, but really anybody can experience stereotype threat if you're in a field where you're not represented, where you're not represented in the classroom, uh, where you're not in, um, you know, represented in the textbooks or the any of the other reading material. Uh, you know, if, if there's nobody in the class that looks like you, uh, that sort of, of thing, right? So how do we address uh, this? And, you know, there's not a magic bullet to eliminating stereotype threat as we see, but research shows that understanding it can help to alleviate it in some cases. For instance, and knowing is half the battle, teaching stereotype threat as a means of improving women's math performance, uh, their research demonstrates that sometimes simply knowing about stereotype threats can help to eliminate them. Uh, here's an interesting study. Men and women, they completed difficult math problems described either as a problem solving task or a math uh, test. So we're going to see you know, words matter, right? When the task was described as a math test with no mention of stereotype threat, then women tended to perform worse than men on the test. There is also research that shows girls often hear the stereotype that women are bad at math by elementary school. I remember hearing it, you know, and I asked younger students if that has changed. And most of the younger students have heard girls are bad at math. So all these efforts to change it, great, you know, to try to empower uh, uh, girls in the field of mathematics. But those stereotypes, you know, are still, I'd say, part of a kind of cultural narrative that is just hard to chip away at. Um, so at any rate, when women are told about the stereotype threat and informed that, hey, you might feel anxiety because of it, then they perform equally. Also, reframing the test as a problem-solving exam resulted in this study, at least, with women performing equally with the male participants. So, you know, I'm reading about Jennifer Saul and I'm thinking, man, you know, how must uh, stereotype uh, th threats impact other people? Can you imagine how they may impact undergraduate uh, students, right? And like I said, anybody can experience a stereotype uh, threat. Steele has an uh, example in his book of a, of a young white man um, in an African-American studies class and, and feeling, you know, uh, a, a stereotype of a white man and thinking, I hope I don't say the wrong thing. I hope I don't do the wrong thing. And that kind of stress uh, throughout that class. And so, you know, still points out, you know, it, it, for, for some people, right, it may be their, a lot of their career, <laughs> right, depending on, depending on the field you're in, where you work and uh, that sort of thing. So what can we do? One of the things when I started uh, learning about stereotype threat is I took a look at my textbooks, right? Many uh, Western philosophy textbooks, I teach um, a lot of, you know, intro philosophy, intro ethics, uh, different courses like that. And a lot of um, uh, them have a lot of articles written by white men. Uh, simply including more writers from diverse backgrounds and perspectives can help students feel more comfortable in the classroom. So if like we have a textbook, we're supposed to use this textbook, or even if I find some textbooks with really good articles, but they're not um, diverse enough for my taste, right? Then I add supplemental reading material or videos in the discussion boards, um, I point to other authors when I'm if I'm doing like a, a seminar, an online seminar with students or in a in a classroom, you know, I say, let's watch this video or let's look at this article or let's read this book and just kind of supplement what we are doing. So people see themselves in the, the classroom. Right. And that's one kind of for me, an easy step to take so that students uh, can say, wait a minute. This author wrote that, and this author kind of reminds me 
of my uh, self. So just, you know, and there's so many different examples you could provide Western philosophy, you know, maybe introducing some Eastern uh, philosophy, maybe a little bit more feminist philosophy, that sort of thing, right? So many textbooks that focus on social contract theory, I noticed didn't include any <laughs> women, right? So I'll teach, you know, the, the famous social contract theories in the textbook. And then one of the things I do is I ask students if um, the women's approach to this topic differs from the men's approaches to this topic. And I have been, you know, a little bit surprised how often nobody even noticed that not one woman was represented in any of the work until, you know, it's brought to their attention. And then we might, you know, discuss Carol Pateman's work or Susan Ogan or, or you know, something like that and try to bring a different perspective. And I have uh, gotten very good at going to Google Scholar and finding articles online and, and so on, right, to kind of supplement uh, some of the textbooks. And, and you know, there is uh, there are um, open, um, you know, education resources and things you can look at now to try to um, help help do those sorts of things. But I think being aware of the importance of representation and including it in the classroom can make a difference. One of the things we want to do is help students really realize and kind of internalize that they belong here, right? <laughs> that, that they are admitted, uh, that we have confidence in them, and, and that they can, they can uh, do this. Another thing we can do is to remind students that they would not be here if we didn't think they could succeed. According to Steele, remind students that tests measure material that they have already mastered. Uh, not their potential to succeed. Uh, so, you know, if somebody, you know, um, in, doesn't do well on a test, that might just mean that they haven't mastered the material yet, or they're introduced to new concepts they still um, have to learn, or maybe find um, ways to, you know, Im improve maybe the study skills or whatever, but it's not their potential to succeed. There is research too, plenty of it, that um, reminding students that we have high expectations for them and that we believe those students can meet those expectations. That is a powerful anecdote to stereotype threat. Additionally, taking the time to provide thoughtful and substantive grading, uh, grading feedback helps students know the instructor believes they are worth their time, right? That we are investing something uh, because we believe they have the potential uh, to succeed. So, of course, personalizing uh, grading uh, feedback. Uh, there, there's some, some research, too, that uh, students that see that their professor uh, cares uh, and has high expectations, uh, that those makes those critiques actually more empowering, right? So, uh, you know, kind of uh, thinking uh, through, through that as well. Uh, so those are just a, a few of the things to think through. Um, and then I also, since I was kind of focusing on gender in this paper, touch briefly on the importance of carefully uh, considering some of the language we use in grading feedback, you know, in letters of recommendation, uh, that sort of, of, of thing. I also wanted to talk about um, how stereotypes uh, can be, you know, nuanced and tricky, right? So stereotype threat, you know, is often um, saying, I want to show that I am not part of this stereotype. And Steele talks about engaging in over-efforting, in an effort to disprove a negative uh, stereotype. And that is, um, it, it's a, like I said, a nuanced and tricky thing. Um, he writes about a conversation with Carol Porter. She mentioned that organic chemistry is a challenging class at the university. Uh, it's important. It's an important class and uh, can be a gateway make or break class for medical school. And really interesting. And once again, I don't know, this reminds me of, of my own experiences. Um, and I you know, wonder if it reminds some of you of your experiences, too. Uh, but so it's a make or break class. Uh, students went over it, hope they can pass it, you know, so they can uh, stay in medical school. But many white and Asian students try to find ways to make sure they don't fail. 
they may investigate community colleges that offer the class, maybe where they have heard, oh, it's easier to pass, you know, this class at, at this community college. And then I think the uh, credits transfer, let's go see if the credits transfer. And if they do, they might take that class and then uh, transfer the credits over from the community college. And then the, the school uh, that they were talking about was Princeton. Um, also, students, you know, um, might sign up for a different um, uh, uh, organic chemistry class. They might um, go into the chemistry class at Princeton, but say, hey, can I audit this class? And, you know, kind of keep an eye out and learn what they can and learn about, you know, how they're going to be evaluated. And then once they figure out how they're evaluated, they'll sign up for the class the second semester and make um, sure they pass it, right? However, you know, black students often, according to this research, and there's been other studies to um, to substantiate this research, uh, they more often want to prove they can pass organic chemistry, darn it, without bending any rules. Um, so often uh, people won't want to go to a community college because they can do it. I'm using the scare quotes there, the right way um, and succeed on their own merits. And I say the right way, right? Because it's the way um, you know that we we think that that the rules are, and that we can meet the the requirement of the rules. That we don't need special treatment, right? For example, for you know stereotype threat from whatever perspective. But this study just w w uh, happened to be with uh, black students that said, well, we're we're going to do it the right way. Uh, we're going to succeed on our own merits, um, and. If they succeed without bending the rules, then they report feeling this can help dispel negative stereotypes. Uh, but, you know, when students have a feeling of something to prove, that can be exhausting. And in certain circumstances, it can be self-defeating, right? Trying to disprove a stereotype takes more work, more effort. Sometimes you're concentrating on, oh, I'm going to break down this stereotype, right? You're thinking about that instead of the organic chemistry material or the math material or, or the philosophical proof or whatever, right? So um, it, it, trying to disprove a stereotype just plain takes more work. It can conflict with the task at hand. You know, it's just one more thing to do. And while pushing ourselves to succeed, you know, is good for some things, absolutely. The focus can also be detrimental at certain points in the journey. Like when you get into high stakes, uh, competitive, complex tasks, right? And other people are taking these, um, you know, shortcuts and you're not, right? It can put you at a disadvantage. But once again, just informing students of this research can be empowering. So I was mentioning, too, how words matter, and I said I would bring us uh, back to that. Uh, studies demonstrate uh, that women, for example, are, are described um, more often as more communal, whereas men are described as more agentic in like letters of recommendation. And those that are described as more communal are often less likely to be hired. And this language can seep into grading uh, feedback, too. For instance, in gender teaching feedback, students' math performance and enrollment outcomes, a text mining approach, there is some evidence that teacher feedback can be gendered, right? It may be more um, gentle sometimes geared towards women. It can be communal good effort, right? <laughs> Empathetic uh, perspective and that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, over the years, there have been studies that do have uh, some uh, mixed results, but there are still some potential pitfalls to look out for when writing grading feedback or writing a letter of recommendation. In one well-known study, women uh, were described more often as communal, whereas men were described as more agentic. Um, those that are described as more communal are less likely to be taken seriously, right? And examples of, you know, so-called male agentic traits are intelligent, competitive, and determined. Examples of communal traits are empathetic, caring, honest, and understanding. But a lot of times in academics, right, um, you know, depending on the field, intelligent, com competitive, and determined take precedence, like they're rated higher than empathy, caring, honest, and understanding. That might be like a nice person, but do they have, you know, the firepower to 
uh, you know, succeed, you, the, that sort of thing. So being careful of the language and thinking about intelligence as well and linking that kind of back to stereotype threat. There's this idea, especially, you know, my field philosophy, that intelligence is innate, right? And if you think intelligence is innate and you could get into implicit bias and all that sort of thing, um, then uh, people that are underrepresented in those fields may think, well, I don't have that kind of innate intelligence. Uh, you know, based on biases of people, they may assume some of their students do not have innate intelligence, right? So kind of staying away from innate intelligence altogether um, is a good thing, especially for a stereotype threat. It helps people, um, you know, focus on high expectations and that hard work and rigor is how we how we really uh, succeed, but also just kind of being um, aware of that um, um, way that languages work and also um, aware of the cultural connotations of, of some of those words, right? The, the words we choose can be more influential than we may always realize. Language is important in grading feedback and may provide a counter narrative, which could be helpful in combating stereotype uh, threat, too. So that is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you uh, so much.